Good afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the country or the world. Welcome back to PPMD 2022 Annual uh, Connect Conference. We're here in Phoenix, Arizona, and this session, as you can see behind me, is learning and behavior uh, and college and preparation for life after high school uh, for teens and adults and everybody out there in virtual land that's streaming in. We're glad that you could join us online today. There'll be a live chat going on that you can join in anytime you want. And if there's questions you have out there online, you can filter them through and we'll try and get them answered right here. If not, we can get back to you later. Uh, my name is Pat Motion and I'm gonna moderate this session. Most of you know that I live in New Hampshire and I uh, have limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which I thought was Becker for 25 years. I teach middle school music and um, I have spent my entire adult life in education. To my left is Austin LeClaire who I will let him introduce himself. And then we have <clears throat> in the middle, uh, Maria McDonald, and we also have Christina Trout with us today. And we are gonna cover all kinds of stuff related to education. And again, plans for after high school. For those of you guys in the audience with Duchenne Becker, uh, we, or everybody, we like to keep things pretty loose and informal. So it's not gonna be us talking and then you asking questions. It's just gonna be a whole go with the flow kind of thing. So if something comes up and you have a question, uh, just raise something in the air at us or shake something or blow your horns and uh, we'll try <laughs> to answer as much as we can. Because as you know from being at conference, one of the best things that happens is robust discussion and connections on all sorts of stuff. So without further ado, we'll start with Austin. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are in your educational journey and, where, right. you, and where you live? Yeah, so my name's Austin. I'm 23 years old. Um, I'm currently in college studying mechanical and biomedical engineering. Um, and I kind of just wanted to come in today and talk about um, some of the things that I wish I had done going into college instead of waiting until stuff got harder. So I, um, so I guess that's it. I'm from Massachusetts. And so I guess that's it. Awesome. And I like already that you've said maybe some things you could have done differently. You know, so recognize Austin's face. I know a lot of you guys know him, but he's now a resource for you. If you're saying, hey, I think I want to go to college, but I have no idea, expert. he's your guy, okay? Maria, welcome. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name's Maria McDonald. I am from Pennsylvania, right outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I kind of have two sides of the perspective. First of all, I'm a, an English professor. Um, I've been teaching writing and lit classes for almost 20 years at a small liberal arts college in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm also a Duchenne mom. So my youngest son is the one who was Duchenne. His name is Aiden, and he's 22. Um, and he just finished, he's on the five-year track, which even a lot of people without <laughs> challenges are on the five-year track these days. So he um, just finished his fourth year of college. Um, he's starting his fifth year He's a biopsychology major. Um, he actually goes to the school where I teach, but um, so I kind of have had the experience of, of, you know, being in the classroom with other students with different types of challenges and disabilities throughout the year, and then, you know, watching my son navigate um, college life for the past four years. Outstanding and interesting perspective. College professor plus son, son with Duchenne in college, and I would imagine that it, it was a forced thing for him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, they were all, all three of my kids were kind of forced to go to the college where I teach, but anybody who's still paying off their college loans knows that you don't turn down free tuition, so. <laughs> Absolutely, and what is the college you're at? It's called Albright College, it's <clears throat> a small Albright. school, yeah. Great, okay. So you could be an Albright scholar and if you hook up with Maria, she <laughs> obviously get your free tuition. For real. Right. <laughs> I do adopt. Anybody who wants to be adopted. Yeah. That, that's what I heard. I don't know what you heard. Okay. And Christina. We, we you, just had technical difficulties. No, listen. You, you, look, you look like Aretha Franklin with that mic. So go ahead and leave you your soul on the stage. <laughs> I'm Christina Trout. I'm a nurse from the University of Iowa. And I've been working with um, families and young people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy for about 32 years. Um, so I have a lot of interest in seeing how things evolved over years and um, hopefully contributing to making sure people are launched um, into their adult years. Um, part of my work has been um, working on the CDC's care considerations 
And then as an extension of that, writing a paper in pediatrics about transitioning um, from youth to adult life in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So if you don't know, there is a thing called the DMD or Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, toolkit for transitioning, and that is on the Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy webpage. I don't know if we've bookmarked it for you, but uh, there is a guide that you can pull up from that area that would give you some areas to think about um, as you're preparing through your teen years and then into your young adult, adult life. We all don't go through high school and our adult life at the same pace. Uh, but some of that planning is going to be the same whether you're going through high school and going into a junior college or college or if you're going to do something completely different and maybe not take an educational path. But um, I'd like to be a resource and help think about those issues. Love it. That's awesome. So I, I think that might be a link. And again, you know, this isn't just about links. It's about life. So all you, uh, you guys in the audience with Duchenne Becker, you... Uh, are quite a bit younger than I am. So just so you know, this is just some background trivia. Uh, education in, in the United States for disabled people wasn't really all that hot until the middle of the 70s when Congress finally got their act together and passed something called the IDEA Act, IDEA, and it was Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that is the first time where school buses had lifts and elevators were put into public schools and all the things that we take for granted today uh, that are almost 50 years ago, they, they weren't there. So we stand on the shoulders of all of those people that first said, hey, every single person in this country has a free right to public education. So that all happened first, and then things have been building out and building out since then. So when you start to think, maybe I wanna go to college, some of the public universities in the country you're gonna find extremely accessible, and then there are others that maybe not so much, uh-oh, I just lost my mic. Paul, oh, I'm going to need you up here, buddy. But in the meantime, I'll just be loud. So <laughs> just remember that, you know, you guys that decide to go into higher education, you're helping to widen the path for the people that come after you. Um, some of you also know that we work with a group of Duchenne Becker individuals called the Patient Adult Advisory Committee. And one of our uh, newer initiatives is we're compiling a list of universities in the United States that are most accessible. Uh, and that's something that's just hot off the press. So that's, that's something we're going to be working on over the next 6 to 12 months so that hopefully a little of the work that maybe you need to do to get to college can be done ahead of time so you know what's going on. So let's start with, with Austin. I'm going to come back to you. Okay. you. You chose to go to college, and you said there were a few things that maybe you would have navigated differently. Could you maybe comment in on a, on a few of those things, please? Yes. Yeah, so one of the most ex um, specific examples that I could think of was um, I had been taking a few classes for a few semesters, and I was taking math classes. And up until this point, I was able to write all my work on my own. So I figured, oh, I don't need accommodations. So after this particular class, I had a quiz. And I was unable to, I was only able to write half of the work. And then the rest I had to just give the answers that I got off my calculator. And I explained to my professor afterwards, hey, I got tired, so I was only able to write half of it. Um, and then he told me that he wouldn't accept that, that I need to go to disability services first. So after that, I chose to speak to disability services and get the scribe I needed and I was able to get my professor to let me retake the quiz. So after that, I realized that I probably should have got a scribe sooner instead of struggling and waiting until I really needed it. So that was one of the most specific examples I could think of, was <clears throat> it's really important to get in touch with disability services ahead of time, before, before you even, probably after you apply. Once you know you get in, you should contact them. And I would think, uh maybe you guys can comment uh, but just about disability services on university campuses. Um, they probably also give a tour and help you understand where and what to ferret out, where to go, things like that. Yeah, so yeah, they definitely tell you on the tour. But to me, I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I don't, I don't need that. Because I'm pr pretty good at asking other students for a copy of their notes and that stuff. 
so I didn't really need help scribing up until this point. So what he just told you is he's cheating through college. That's right. <laughs> right. When he says asking other people for their notes, that translates into I'm going to buy the test from you. No, I'm just kidding. Christina, you look like you're, re you're ready to go. Yeah. That's a fairly common experience that um, things change over time, and mm. you might need different services at a different time. Um, I would recommend through high school that you're meeting with your school counselors and your teachers and you're setting up if you don't have a 504 plan, a 504 plan, or an IEP, some of those accommodations that you even might use in high school, it helps if they're written down in advance of going to college because then when you go and have like a tour of a campus where you think you might be interested in attending, uh, you can meet with the disability services or access um, services on the campus and talk to them about what kinds of accommodations you may have had in the past and what you might need in the future. Um, so I think it can be helpful to have a written idea before you go. And then um, there are, and maybe Austin can talk about this, or Maria, about once you're working with that office, um, a lot of times they can set things up that you may not even anticipated that you might want or need. Do you want to speak on well, any of those? Either? Just let me jump in real quick. Something yeah. you just said triggered me to think too. Okay. Don't forget, guys, that it's important that the university or college probably, like a lot of other people, has no idea what the Shannon Becker muscular dystrophy might be. So when you say disability, they might think you need a standard set of accommodations, period. But as she just said, we all know our condition is progressive. So it's important to advocate for yourself saying, listen, stuff that I ask for freshman year, it, it will change by senior year. So our plan needs to be fluid and changing at all times. Okay, important, important uh, safety tip, right? Maria, did you have anything on um, college a tours? A couple things were coming up while you were yeah. saying that about planning early. Um, I'm kind of on the same page as Austin. I'm all like, yeah, we'll figure it out, you know. <laughs> um, and, and my son made it all the way through 12 years of public school without having an aid just because, you know, other students would pick up his backpack or get the door. Um, so we had a really rude awakening um, during college orientation. You know, classes hadn't even started yet, um, and Aiden was going to college orientation. And the only thing he really needed me for was to help him with the bathroom. Um, and so he didn't have an aid, and you know, he had never met with the Office of Disabilities and Advocacy. Um, so I just hung out in my office doing work, and I was like, just text me if you need me. And um, the person who was in charge of that office um, is thankfully not there anymore, but um, she, she called me in her office. She said, why doesn't Aiden have an aid? And I said, well, you know, we don't really need an aid right now. She said, well, who's pushing the elevator buttons and opening the doors? I'm like, well, he's in a group of students. You know, you go through orientation with a group of students. She said, well, they shouldn't have to do that for him. And I thought, well, you know, we live in a, like, is it really hard for an 18 year old to open the door for another kid? Like they don't care. But that was the attitude I was met with, and, and it has been more flexible. But I really learned quickly that um, in college, <laughs> it has to be on paper. You know, you will have some professors who will be super accommodating, and it will, like your math professor, you know, you might have had another professor who was like, no big deal, Austin, but next time, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of professors will, you know, when you meet with the office, they will give you a list of accommodations that you give to all your professors. And a lot of professors are going to, you know, stick to that list and say, well, that's, that accommodation isn't on here and you don't qualify for that. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't be like me. <laughs> Plan ahead, you know, meet, make sure that all, and like Pat said too, say, well, these are the accommodations I know I need right now, but, uh, you know, I may need to come back to you at the end of the semester because this wasn't working for me or that wasn't working for me. Uh, but make sure it's all on paper. Right, and as the individual with Duchenne Becker that is going to be at the college, I strongly suggest, and Austin, you could speak to this, once you have the initial meeting, then you would say to the disability office, yeah, I'd like to schedule another meeting in two weeks just to let you know how things are going. And then maybe next semester, can we talk again about how things are going? It doesn't mean you're going to be a squeaky wheel and, and a pain in the butt. It means that you're obviously very vested in your education and you want to make sure that everybody's a team working from the same side of the table. I can't tell you how many times in my, in my public school education career, parents will come in and they're pounding on the desk and they're demanding things for their autistic child or 
they're demanding this and they're demanding that. And I want to say, we, you know, we're all here to work together to help raise your child. And we all have to come at it at the same point. Austin, um, what Maria just said triggered a question I have for you. You've worked with a lot of different professors. Have you, have you taken a same tact with everyone? Do you kind of say, here's who I am, this is it? Or do you wait and feel out the teacher and then see, oh, I got to talk to this person? I generally like to speak to my professor first yeah. before I get in contact with disability services just to see how flexible they are to see if they'll just give me the accommodation without hearing from them. Well, and you've learned too that you're, you're cutting out the middleman. You, know, you probably yeah. don't need to go all the way around the corner. It's good to have that on paper as a backup or as a reference plan. But you know, you talk to the person. Um, besides your math professor, do you have an opposite story of a professor that's been really awesome? Yes, yeah, so some of the professors that um, I've been taking multiple classes with, like my physics class, the first year I had the same professor, he was really accommodating, which was great. And then I have him this semester as well for physics too. And so um, the professors I've had before, they just give me the accommodations because they remember what I needed. Good. And when you say really accommodating, could you be specific? When they're willing to notice that it's a pain in the ass for me to go to disability <laughs> services instead of just having them provide it because I'm very clearly disabled. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> we could have a whole session on that, right? Yeah. That has nothing to do with Duchenne. Yeah. Uh, it just, Austin, I've, we've known each other for 20 years, so I can bust on him. Um, Christina, you mentioned earlier an IEP and or a 504. Just for people in the audience that maybe haven't navigated the waters, could you just speak a little bit to the difference between the two plans? I'm not super well versed at it, so oh. Maria may be better. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, typically the 504 plan has to do with physical accommodations, yeah. making sure that the building and the classroom and your education as a whole is accessible, that like you can access it and it's working for you. An IEP goes a little further than that. Sometimes those will have a health plan in them to meet your health needs while getting your education. And it can also um, provide some accommodations if you have um, specific learning disabilities or you need even uh, the accommodation of extra time on tests or that you need it done in a certain manner because you don't, your preferred way of taking a test isn't to have all the questions written out and do it all at once. So there are fine details that you can tune into those plans. Right. And, and usually that 504 or IEP gets established in your high school years. Not, it's not something that you get once you're in college. And, um, you know, if you feel like you're unsure that you're getting what you need, ask for more advocacy. Usually there's someone in your school that's a, pers a person that can be your personal advocate, like a family navigator. Seek out in your school who that might be, and being in the school systems, you may know who those people are. Um, sure. And Maria might have additional thoughts about any of that. I think you covered it really well, um, you know, the difference between the 504 and, and the IEP. Um, just transitioning, transitioning to college, um, you know, as far as, like you said, the building being um, accessible in all ways and things like that, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, I'll say one thing that I thought of when all of you were talking is, I don't know, is your school a small school, Austin? Like yeah, so it's a community college, so I would assume that they're probably more, they're probably more likely to be more rigid about how accessible they are. I yeah. would assume a private college, it would be, they'd probably be a little more flexible about how accessible it is. Actually, I'm going to argue it's the I think opposite. it's kind of, yeah. It's the opposite. Well, the public <laughs> schools are taking, you know, fed, more federal money. So yeah. they're kind of like, well, I, I've found talking to a lot of guys, and I don't know if anybody in the audience that's currently in college wants to weigh in, but I've found that some of the private colleges are more rigid, and they'll say, listen, you know, you knew what you were getting into. This is all private money. If this isn't the place for you, there's plenty of other places to go, um, which I'll, is unfortunate, I'll, but yeah. you're at a small private school. What? Yeah, so I would say, like, just real quick, you know, if you're looking at colleges, big college versus small college, it, it, you know, there's co pros and cons to each. I teach at a small private college, and it's a very old campus. It's beautiful, but it's terribly inaccessible. Mm. Um, there are dorms where Aiden can't, you know, he doesn't stay in a dorm. He does live at home and commute, but my older sons, when they were on campus, there are dorms he can't get into. 
uh, you know, the, it's the elevator. It, it's not great for physical um, accommodations, and, and it really would be very challenging if, if a young man wanted to live on campus. It's not impossible, but challenging. Uh, the, the pros there are that you really get to know your professors well. Um, Mo you know, we all have a relationship with our students. We know them when we see them on campus. And, and I think, like you said, you re reach out to your professors. That is super important, I think. Establish a relationship with your professors early. You know, let them know what you need. Most, most of us are, are very, you know, understanding. And, and we know, you know, our, every student is an individual. Um, the pros about big state schools is that there are going to be a lot more accessible. You're going to have... Uh, you know, a lot more options and, and a ability to get around. They'll have more resources for you. Um, but, you know, then the flip side of that is that a lot of your classes are going to be, you know, hundreds of people in a lecture hall, and it'll be harder to um, have relationships with uh, professors who are kind of outside of your majors. So, you know, again, if you're planning to live on campus or you're planning to commute, those are just kind of things to consider. I think Good one course. thing that you could do when you're considering the big school, little school, um, is to, when you meet with the school and have your tour, is to ask, are there any students attending here that I could talk to about their experiences on the campus? Um, because they may give you the inside scoop as to whether or not the campus is really accessible or not. That's good. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes they do have a list of students um, that are kind of guides on campus that would be willing to give you um, that inside story. Uh, I work with a few students that are attending college that do live in the campus dorms, and that's been one of the things that we really had to talk more seriously about. They planned to go there, and they had not considered their caregiving before getting on campus. And by caregiving, I mean simple things like using the restroom um, and showering. And so I think some of those things need to be part of your equation. Usually the bus system on campus is, you know, they have bionic buses, place, they can get you place to place. Um, but your day-to-day -day living experiences need to be considered and planned for, you know, before you get on campus. So that would be a tip I would recommend. And if you want to go down that road, I can talk to you a little bit about funding and, and how you go about setting up these people. Do you want me to speak on that? Or? Well, let me, yes, but... <laughs> just no, it just again it it jogged my brain. I'm up in New Hampshire, and I I know the University of New Hampshire and a lot of other large universities in the country. They also have uh, established programs where certain students that are maybe exercise or physiology majors, sports management majors, they give those kids uh, tuition breaks if they want to become an an aide for someone and be roomed with someone that has a disability. And uh, a very good friend of mine who's a phys ed teacher, he did it all through four years of college um, with a, a gentleman that had been in a diving accident uh, and was paralyzed from the waist down, and they were roommates. And he said, you know, I knew going in I was going to become his caretaker. I also know I wanted to go into exercise physiology. So, you know, it's a kind of a cool avenue that a lot of universities have started to explore where suddenly now, you know, you're not... It's not a ton of out-of-pocket cost because it's just the roommate, and the roommate is getting uh, education, and it, it, it's a win-win for everybody. So certainly something to ask for, and I know also that just about every place will also, you know, do private tours. You know, you don't have to go through in a group of 100 people. You can set it up and visit the campus and, and call ahead of time and say, listen, right. you know, we have some considerations that we're going to want to talk with you about, um, things like that, and then because I'm all over the road, before we go back to that, the 504 and the IEP, when I have parents come in in middle school and they're like, I, I don't understand what my child needs, I always say, you know, a 504 is you're requesting another set of textbooks to be at home. Mm -hmm. I'm dating myself. What's a textbook, right? <laughs> a, an IEP is my child has trouble with reading comprehension and may need somebody to scribe or help with the brain part. A 504 is all the classes should be, you know, in a certain area of the building. Also a pro tip from college, uh, the universities will, they will move classes for you. So if you are yeah. on a big university where there's, you know, North Campus, South Campus, East, and you look at your schedule and you say, I can't do this, go to the disability office, they'll, they'll put the classes all in one spot for you. Or they'll adjust your schedule so that you have time to get everywhere. Uh, every, you know, 
Everybody is mostly flexible as long as you initiate the conversation, you know, and don't try to be a hero and say, I have 10 minutes to get 45 minutes away by the bus for this math class. They'll just move it. I went to math University. Math isn't worth that. No, math isn't worth that. <laughs> but same thing. I went to University of Massachusetts, the Lowell campus near Boston, and it was Lowell Textile from when they were mills. So I, I had classes in buildings that were built in the 1890s. And then, you know, what's an elevator? That, you know, so they said, oh, we'll just put it on the first floor, we'll move it. And this was, you know, 1992. So if it was that good back then, I'm sure 30 years later I'm dating myself, it's got to be much better now. So, you know, have the conversation, but I would say plan ahead. And even if you don't have an IEP or a 504, you know, start jotting down things that you know you're going to need thinking about your daily life. And for you guys that are Duchenne Becker, I didn't say have mom and dad make the list. Mom and dad aren't going to college. They probably already went. You need to make the list because you're the one that's going to be doing this. They already went to school, right? So got to gotta advocate for yourself. When you said that... Um, oh, yeah, I'll, over and over again. <laughs> that very tip about writing things down. So if you are interacting with one of your siblings or your mom or your dad to, like, get something accomplished, whether that's putting your glasses on your face or pouring the milk out of your, you know, to on your cereal, those are the kinds of things that you need to think about as you're planning for who's going to do that if you move away from home. And it's not to say that it can't be done, but I can tell you it helps if you're practicing those things with someone else before you leave the home. So I think it's a good idea to like get comfortable directing someone else to help you with the things that you need. Because if you've always had someone anticipating your needs, because I know moms especially are super duper good at this, that they can see, oh, they need this done, I'm gonna jump right in there and do it. But when you leave home, you don't realize how many times someone right. is doing those little tiny yeah. things. And so it's helpful if you get used to telling someone else, like, hey, could you open the store for me? Hey, could you do this for me? And it gives you more confidence then for when you're out in the big college campus um, of asking someone else for help. And, and I would argue, you know, cross, cross ripping sessions that that's not college, that's life. Yes. You know, you need to do that anyway because you're going to be a grown up or already you are. And um, also, you, know, you say, well, I, it's hard for me to make a list. Okay, that's another excuse. Everybody has a phone, you audio voice it. You know, you set up a college day at your house. All right. From when you get up to when you go to bed, you're going to have your phone on and you're going to voice memo everything that we, we, you need help with. And then later we'll set up a Google Doc and then we're going to look at all the stuff because you're going to find out. You say, oh, I might need help with five or six things a day. You get to the end of the day, there's 68 things on the list, which is fine. But those are all the things you need to plan for right. so that you don't get there and go, uh-oh. And another difference between if, if any of you are in high school or have had an yeah. aide in public yeah. school, um, you know that that person works for the school district. They're there to help you during the day, but they are you know they work for the school district. When you get to college, colleges do not provide aides or caregivers for students. That's not in the realm of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you need to find your own caregiver if you need one on campus. So that person's working for you now. That's not you know an employee of the school district. That is your personal employee. So yeah, you're kind of the boss, and you need to. You know, it's weird. Adulting is weird. I teach college freshmen most of the time, you know, and just taking our, you know, just college freshmen who have no disabilities, no other challenges. Those first semesters are hard. It is crazy hard. Just navigating a new world, and if you're living on your own, you throw into the mix this is the first time that you are on your own and managing your own care and saying, I need this and I need that. You know, it, it's... Um, it's a very, you know, you grow up fast and it's a great experience, but don't be afraid, you know. I think yesterday in one of the sessions, um, if you guys know Gretchen Enger, she said, Egner, she said um, there's a fine line between helicopter parenting and neglect, right? Um, and so, you know, I have three sons that are all adults. Um, but even adults, you know, you, you don't need your mom there, like, holding your hand and making all your lists for you and things like that. But, you know, if the, for the first semester or two, it's interesting to find that balance, you know, take baby steps into it. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. But remember that it's hard for everybody. And by the end of the first semester, you're going to be like, oh, you know, I got this. Right. But I would, again, argue and push the point that the first time this happens in your life should not be the first semester of college. 
You know, it should probably start when you're in maybe fourth or fifth grade. You know, when somebody says, oh, gee, hey, dad, can you go into my classroom this year again and tell everyone about Duchenne muscular dystrophy? If you're the parent, your answer is no, you can, because I don't have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You do. And that might sound harsh, but as the student grows up, they're gonna, it's going to become second nature. So then when they're in the grocery store and somebody looks at them, they automatically just go, oh, yes, I have special muscles. Can you reach that for me, please? No problem. Instead of being like frozen in panic and what do I do now? Yeah. Right? So education and beyond. Before we move on, Austin, I know you want to jump in. We have an online comment coming in from uh, Mark uh, Schmertman. What would the recommendation be for a family at a rural or small public school who has an IEP but the school doesn't have the resources available to provide the need needed supports and accommodations. Now my teacher voice says, one, get a family advocate, and then if the school still does not do it, two, you have a lawyer, and then you'll see how fast the accommodations show up. I would agree um, that yes, if you have one of those formal plans written out, it has legal teeth to it. It's a state law. It's a state law. That means that the school has to provide it whether they have the money to do it or not. The schools often actually get money for students with disabilities. Yes. That money is to go for your needs. So if the school is telling you that they don't have the resources, they have to come up with them. If you're still having problems, yes, it's an attorney. Many states have a, an I what's called Disability Rights Iowa. You could Google what is some resources in your community. Uh, many school districts have um, also outside of the school uh, agencies, ours is called Area Agent Education Agency, that has like physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, these kind of extra people that can come in and help navigate what it is that you need, help write accommodations, help look at the funding, and help to get those things in place. And again, it's all in the ask, right? It's you know, in I, the ask. I, I always am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, fire, aim, and that's a bad quality of my life. Uh, so instead, it might have been, listen, if you're, you know, if you're having trouble, how can we help you? What is the barrier to these accommodations? Then the district says, well, it's money. Well, can we talk about how much? And you, know, you start to find the path instead of going in and pounding, and I demand this and that. You know, but then if you get a lot of pushback, you move to the next level. And you say, I'm, I'm going to be contacting a family advocate, and I'd like to sit down again and figure this out because, yes, Rural or not, by law, they have to. Yep. Or they just try and rewrite the IEP and take it out. But you come and see me about that later on. We can <laughs> navigate that shark-filled waters, too. Typically, my mom and I just play good cop, bad cop. Yep, that's another way to do it. Who's the good cop and who's the bad cop? I'm typically the good cop that comes with a reasonable, ex <laughs> an e a reasonable solution. And then my mom's like, you're going to do what he tells you to. <laughs> if it, it, but again, you if bring it gets, in the big guns. It, yeah, if it gets that far, you know, but a lot of times I'm sure you don't have to do that. And how, how old were you in school when you started kind of advocating for yourself? I mean, it, I don't think it was the first year of college. I feel like it's probably in kindergarten, if I had to guess. Mm. Because my mom had been fundraising for PPMD at my school since I was very young, so... So you just kind of doing that stuff all the time. Well, and again, I would argue that that's why you're a very independent adult, you know, because it was yeah. upon you at an early age that, you know, the disease touches everyone in the family, but you are the one living with it. So you have to help yourself. Yeah. Yep. Maria, words of wisdom for how to cheat through, uh, get through college? Um, a couple things, again, depending where you go, you may be a trailblazer. <clears throat> like, I think that, again, at small schools, when the, the Office of Accessibility and Advocacy, what they typically see are learning disabilities, you know, or attention deficit disorder things. So they have kind of a standard list of accommodations, extra time on tests, you know, um, like two or three things that a lot of students need and they just kind of print those off, print those off, print those off. Uh, they, if you have, you know, have actual physical accommodations that you need, that might be something really new, um, you know, and, and even like your needs are going to be different than kids with CP or different, you know, the, like I had, you know, your needs are just going to be different than probably what a lot of these schools have seen. So you need to educate them. So you need to educate them. <coughs> and you know that you can say that's not my job and it sucks that it is your job, but you're also, like I said, you're trailblazing. You're educating people and you're enriching their lives by, you know, sharing your experience with them. So go in there and, you know, let them know what you need. And there was another uh, spot that some of our um, students have reached out to was the student government on campus. 
Um, so they ask to have a position, like there's the, whatever the Greek system is, you know, they have all these different groups that sit on the government of the university. And so the persons with disabilities, they asked for a chair at that table so that they could also have input on their campus for students with different needs. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there are a few other places that you can, you know, yield power and, you know, put, lean on people. Um, and you can be a part of those groups too. Like if you see a need, you can find ways to fill it. And go in there and help. That's a great point. We, in the pack, we have a, a, a young man named Adith and he went to the University of Maryland and he was the chairman mm -hmm. of the Disabled Students Committee uh, because he was, he said, I got to go in there and make change. And you're, you're blazing the trail, but you're also, you know, you're, you're normalizing this whole thing. Yeah. You know, again, we shouldn't be sitting up here saying, isn't it so wonderful that these young men have gone to college? No, now that's an expectation. You know, 25 years ago it wasn't, now it just is. So when you go in there and you educate them about Duchenne Muscular Dish for you, tell them what it is, the next person that goes in, the person's gonna say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I know about this. And then you say, well, everyone, even with Duchenne is different. So I need this, I need that. So Austin, you, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, so one of the things that I was having difficulties is with mechanical engineering, for example, there's I would a have lot difficulties of, with that too. There's a lot of math <laughs> and really advanced classes, um, subjects that you have to learn. And my issue was having someone scribe for me because it requires someone that understands the math, not mm -hmm. just like because they have to know what I'm telling them to write. And it's a foreign language if you don't do it. Good point. So that was one of the bigger issues is my school is having issues providing accommodations for my level of classes that I have to take. Good and point. then the other thing that I think it's really important for people to know is I think you have to know your rights before you talk disability services as well. Because recently, because during the pandemic, I, had take, I was taking a class that required us to come in for labs. And I said, it's not safe for me to go in there mm -hmm. and I won't be able to do the lab anyways. I need a lab partner. And they, didn't, they wanted to still make me go into class and they're like, we don't really care. And so I contacted Disability Services and said what the problem is. And then they suggested to me, maybe wait until after the pandemic to take it again. But I told them, no, 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 that's discrimination. You can't do that. And so, so what happened? So the, eventually, my professor was re being really nasty to me. So eventually I had to have my mom email her. And after that, like, my mom sent her a really angry email explaining my condition and all this other stuff. And all she could say was, okay. But eventually she just gave me the accommodations because she realized that she couldn't really do anything about it. Right. And again, you know, you're dealing, we all know, you're dealing with, I don't want to say ignorance is a strong word, but you're dealing with uneducated people to this condition. It happens all the time, right? I can't come in this and that. Oh, you have MS? No, I don't. We could tell that joke all day too, but <laughs> but eventually it was able to be resolved. Right? Yes, yep. Maria, I saw you raising oh, yeah, your hand man, like, when a, you said like that, a good student. That like triggered me. So, <laughs> so like I said, Aiden's a biopsychology major. So like you, Austin, he's got a lot of labs. He's got a lot of bio classes, and his very first semester he had an intense bio class with a lab, and he told them, I you know he can't lift his arms. He can't use a, a microscope on his own, and he's like, I'm gonna need. A, a, an aide in the, in the lab to help me just to work the equipment. And again, this is the same woman that gave me a hard time. The first she said, I don't think that's fair. That's giving you an unfair advantage if you have someone. To, I'm like, maybe students who can use their arms have an unfair <laughs> advantage. I was just floored that she would say that. And then she literally said to my son, maybe you shouldn't be a biology major if you can't use the equipment in the lab. For real, and like that was the first time in my life that anybody had ever discouraged any, you know, like, you know, throughout school, people are so helpful, so accommodating, and I was just like, welcome to the real flipping world, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. wow, it, and, and, and ever, oh shoot, I'm sorry. Ever since then, we haven't really had any problems, but, you know, you might come across stuff like that, y'all. It, it's, people, um, don't understand, and, and like Pat said, Pat said ignorance is a strong word, but I'm gonna use it. Sometimes they're really, you are gonna face ignorance, and th if you do, then you get Austin's mom to send an email, and <laughs> she'll take care of yeah, that Yeah, if for any you. of you need her to do it, she'll be more than happy <laughs> to. I think there has, okay, yeah, that's a terrible story. Um, I think it can be helpful if you, um, like if you're going to a school where some of your friends are also going to the same school, 
if you're taking any of the same classes, I think that's been a nice partnership if you know some people in the class or if you're like joining a club related to your major. Um, sometimes you'll meet people in the club and you can say, hey, I have this need. Um, you know, now that I know you, would you be willing in the classroom to provide you know, this help in the room? And usually the professors, I, it's my impression anyway, that they're allowing friends to help not do the work, but to do right. the physical aspects. So um, finding some other partnerships. And I wanted to mention um, just one other thing about finding uh, people on campus to help. Um, some of our families have found um, that when they went to like MDA camp and they had camp counselors that were their counselors, they're oftentimes like not that much older than them and going to college. And those are great people to reach out to on campus. And our, uh, our camp that hosts our MDA camp, they keep a, like a ledger of anybody and wh what colleges they're going to. And the other ones, we have a lot of firemen that volunteer. Um, and so if they live in the same city where you're going to college, believe it or not, those people are often willing to come in and be your helpers. Um, and I have found that um, if you're setting up a schedule for helpers while you're living on campus, you usually need about six to eight people hired um, to be your caregivers because if they're in college at the same time as you, they're going to have class schedules that they're working around too. And so, and they get sick and things, you know, have other things that they need to do. So usually you're looking at trying to find um, six to eight friends or hired caregivers while you're at school, if you're living on campus. Great point. A backup plan and a backup to the backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions so far, you guys? Because I just realized we only have about five minutes. We've just been blabbing for an hour. Yes. Oh, well, hold on. We have a microphone coming. Only so that the people in virtual streamland can hear. Um, so my son, Jack, sitting here beside me, he is going to live on campus. Um, his twin on the other side of me is going to be a helping hand, but our state doesn't cover enough hours, so we're going to have to use them, and I hadn't even thought about someone having to go to class with him. So any, is that something you have to have someone with you for everything, or just maybe those labs where he's going to need a little more hand, of a you know, hand? Yeah, so I would say um, in class, um, I don't think he would need very much help in class because oftentimes when you ask disability services for a scribe, for example, that's just going to be another student that's writing for them, writing for him. So I think that during class time, probably not. And like obviously like using the bathroom and stuff, but I would probably try to plan that around classes because you're really just going to be sitting there. It doesn't make sense to have someone paid to just sit there. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, I was surprised that where Jack's going to school, the housing, those accommodations were handled by a completely separate office. And actually, they were much more accommodating than the people handling education. So I don't know if that's true everywhere, but we actually had to, to work through two different offices to get everything in place. Interesting point. That's but, been you know, my experience is that, that um, housing is actually separate from, uh, you might be guaranteed like housing on the first floor and accessible, you know, shower stalls and some of that, but um, it is a different group setting those up. Yeah. I, I was going to just bring this next point up probably to wrap our discussion, but it's coming in online what I was going to say. Uh, it looks like, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, sorry, Rahel or Ra Rahil? Oh, it's Ra oh, Rachel, sorry. <laughs> if the young man with DMD is not able to or does not want to attend further education due to learning disabilities or just not wanting to go to college, what are some other activities that you suggest that they do to further themselves as a human being? I put that out to you guys. Some of you guys in the audience probably, you're like, yeah, this is great, but I don't really want to go to college. What are you going to do? Playing GTA all day is not an option. <laughs> or if it is, your parents should unplug the Xbox. <laughs> so you guys sitting out here, when you turn 18, you have no plans. You're going to sit outside and rot under a tree? Jack? Huh? <laughs> it's just like my classroom. Um, no, I mean, I've always considered just going to college. That's like always been my plan. Okay. So I haven't really thought about what you would do if yeah. you didn't really want to go to college. Okay, I guess it's a little unfair because probably if you're in here, you probably are going to go to college, which is why you're at the session. But yeah. is there a um, Well, 
No, it's okay. You're, you're gonna. Do you want to? You can volunteer. Um, yeah. That's one thing you could do. Um, I um, play power soccer through um, an organization in cool. Richmond called Sportable. So that's been good. Um, but yeah. Sorry yeah, volunteering, athletics. No, you're doing fine. Do you, do you want the mic? I think Kyle has the mic. Kyle wants the mic. Kyle. Yeah, I was just going to add, like, volunteering, like Rob, you said, uh, for, like, the suicide hotline or stuff like that. Yeah, those of you that haven't met Ravi, he was actually on the Dine poster, and uh, Ravi has Duchenne, and um, he's in law school, but on the, on the side, he took a entire weekend seminar to be certified to uh, volunteer on the National Suicide Hotline. So what he does in some of his spare time is he, he takes and filters calls. And, you know, you want to talk about something very fulfilling, uh, find Ravi and ask him about that because he's, he's enjoying that. So, yeah, I mean, volunteering. What, I mean, what about you guys that are moms? What, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I, I, Aiden it wants to study animal behavior. And so he, um, like on campus, he, we have a special, it's called like an acre program. He works with one of the um, professors there to talk about, um, you know, studying animal behavior. And so he does that. That's part of campus, but it's, it's outside of academics. And, and um, he wants to, and this is one of those things, again, where I keep pushing him, but he's got to take the step to volunteer at like an animal refuge or wildlife center over the summer. Um, he'd be so good at that. And I'm sorry to put Kyle on the spot, but I know I was talking to Kyle there night too, and you, you have a job, right? I mean, you have like a paying job. So, I mean, there's, uh, my son does not have a paying job. I wish he would, but it, <laughs> how many hours a week do you work, Kyle? I work about like 16 hours a week. I work with all moms though. Do, doing what? <laughs> you say that like it's a bad what, what are you doing? I work at a, gar a garden center. Very good. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're hearing us up here, there's something you can do. You just have to figure out, you know, you got to get out of bed every day with a purpose. So, you know, and it doesn't maybe take the traditional path of going to school, getting a high-ranking job, buying a house with a picket fence, having 1.3 children and a dog. <laughs> but you got to do something. You can't sit around and be a lump. I think if there's no other questions, I don't know if you guys are running off, um, but usually what we've done is, you know, we're here. We're here for the rest of the, of the time. Please come and find any of us, or even right now, if you have a question you don't want to ask in front of the whole room, um, that's fine too. But I want to thank our panel, and I hope this was good for you guys. I hope you learned something, and please let us know how else we can help. Thank you for coming in today, guys. Thank you. Thank you.